Welcome to Mental Health Monday. My name is Mick Coyle, coming up on the programme this week. The premise of commercial imagery is to make you dissatisfied with your life. The more dissatisfied you are, the more you can consume. I'm sort of imagining that eventually just our brains turn to, to, to sort of like a gloop whereby... And we've just absorbed so much. We've seen so much that nothing even has an impact. It's more thinking, well, how do we slowly but surely every day so I twitch a bit our behavior so that we get back into a position where we are leading more than actually being on the receiving end. And I'll be reminding you how you can make connections with mental health organizations within your community. It's Mental Health Monday. The home of the UK's conversation about mental health. Welcome to Mental Health Monday. My name's Mick. Great to have you with us once again. Thanks for checking out the podcast. Always a pleasure to hear from you and for your recommendations for guests for future podcasts here at Mental Health Monday. Always happy to have them uh, on board. If you've got recommendations, great people you know, spoken to, organisations, those with stories to tell, absolutely. Let's be hearing them. It'd be a pleasure to feature some of them in future editions. We've got a lot moving at the moment here at Mental Health Monday, and there's many, many conversations to come. So thank you for uh, sticking with us on the podcast, wherever you're listening. If it's uh, in the car, if you are on a run, if you are on a walk, if you are maybe in bed, I'll speak a bit quieter. Um, Just settling down at the end of play. Uh, Today's conversation is one based on a subject which I don't think we've ever touched on, but it's such an obvious subject when we think about it. Um, Our guest is Maureen Tongi. Now, uh, Maureen has written a book. The book is called The Visual Detox, uh, How to Consume Media Without Letting It Consume You. And this is a really interesting subject because every day we see so much and we are absorbing so much. And so much of that is coming from screens and billboards, advertisements, the side of a bus, you name it, you look at it. Every second of the day, we're being hit with images, with visuals. But what's going on inside our brain that allows us to deal with that, to understand what we're looking at, and also to think critically about what we're looking at? Are we looking at a nice painting on a wall and that's there to um, inspire or create a feeling of awe or wonder? Am I looking at an advert? Is that advert trying to sell me something? Am I interested in that product? Do I find that advert appealing? Um, Oh, look, here's another advert. Do I find that advert appealing? How do I feel about that one compared to the last one? Your brain is ticking over all the time with these thoughts, dealing with the things that you are seeing. And actually, what's really interesting for Marine is that you can actually train your brain to think differently, to educate yourself about how you deal with the amount of stuff we see on a regular basis. Now, of course, as part of this conversation, we'll touch on social media. That will be a big part of it as well. Um, But so much when you are out and about is about absorbing visuals and then your brain having to deal with them. But how does it deal with them? And how does that affect you and the way you feel about your surroundings? The book is called The Visual Detox. It's out now. And Marine at the start sets out just how many of these types of images our brains are having to deal with every day. The one I quote often is the fact that we are consuming 10,000 images a day. Um, so let's just sit two seconds with the idea of 10,000 images a day. That is just simply too much. It's too much information, right? And it's mainly 99% of those images will be commercial imagery. Um, only 1% will be a bit of nature, a bit of art, but it's actually tiny in the amounts of commercial imagery that you're constantly confronted with. And what's concerning with this is the premise of commercial imagery is to make you dissatisfied with your life. The more dissatisfied you are, the more you can consume. Also, the more less mentally happy you'll be with yourself as you're looking at it. So first is to think, visuals people tend to think, is it just because sometimes I go to a museum or am I even part of this world? Is to make you acknowledge the fact that you are living in this visual world. Those 10,000 images are here to stay. They're not just your screen. There's you commuting to work. There's the adverts that you see on the tubes. You are in this visual world. And whether or not you don't want to be, that's actually irrelevant because you're part of it. Um, I think people tend to think this is not their world, but it's very much theirs. Um, it says in the book that uh, the vast majority of what we learn is from sight. So obviously just sort of from a, a, a physical point of view, we've evolved in this way to be constantly picking up this information is there a danger that the world that we've created now is going too far in another direction that actually we're almost being over uh stimulated by too many uh, visuals and almost our brains are losing the ability to maybe comprehend which are the ones we really need to prioritize 
Yeah, and I'm sure as you ask the question, you're being concerned with it because otherwise I think you wouldn't be asking. Um, I think there's a big difference in, first of all, how information is being processed. The sound travels really slowly to the brain. Images travel very fast to the brain. What that means is that um, they, the 10 first images you're consuming daily, for instance, they will be landing on the more primitive side of your brain, your fight and flight, the amygdala. And that's different to your analytical part because you're not analyzing, you're responding straight away on affect. And as I'm saying this, you probably have been thinking, yes, that's true. Like, as I look at certain images recently, I've been triggered by them um, because that's your emotional response over the analysis. The problem with emotional response is that you haven't given your time that perspective, that distance with the information. And ultimately, that is also what creates this kind of triggering feeling or feeling mentally quite overwhelmed. So it's all the same type of um, of information. I think second also, from the conversation we're having and from most conversations, you tend to remember 20%. And I don't want to order my partially the podcast world, but the 20% is very valuable. In the visual world, you remember 60%, but again, it's not stored the same way. You remember it, but it's stored again in the more primitive side of the brain, which means it's inducing on your behavior without you realizing it. Whereas the 20% we remember from this conversation, I will be able to explain it to someone. I'll be able to say, this is, and I hope the same with the listener, this is what I've understood from that conversation. So the, the problem again, and that's what we advocate with the book for a critical thinking, a visual critical thinking, is a lack of distance. The fact that this only affect that's responding to all those visuals makes it incredibly overwhelming. That's what makes it ultimately very worrying um, for the state of the brain. We talk about that sort of um, uh, evolving mindset, if you like, of, you know, I think about the, the caveman and uh, somebody who would look out over their, uh, their crops or somebody who might look at, you know, the, the animals they've got to catch and they might be in that forest environment. But actually, this world of 2024, it's not only is there more to look at, but also what we're looking at is in many ways designed to manipulate us. So it's designed for our brain not just to go, OK, the sun's out today or the moon's rising today. It's actually going, look at me, consider me, um, interact with me, let me distract you from something else. That's a, that's a whole other part, isn't it? And that's a, that's a, very, that's a, a human inflicted part of this conversation that we've got to talk about. I think whatever opinion is here to enforce a point of view, ultimately, I think my, my problem here is that there's a singular intent on most of those images, which is to push you to consume. But I think it's fair to consume. It's fair to have, again, people trying to sell products, you know? I think it's more the problem is that this is a majority of images that you're looking at. Um, it's the same with opinions. Ultimately, it's, it's a fair thing to have an opinion. If you're only seeing the same one, this is becoming problematic. So. I will be more moderated on that point where, you know, it's less about manipulation. It's more that we are manipulated because we do not learn visual education. We do not understand how to challenge the visuals and even enter that conversation in the first place. Um, and also right now, we are mostly faced with the same intent, which is the commercial intent. And I would like to say that you could have more civic intent and you could have again, visual narratives that are pushing different types of conversations in your public space. So it's about multiplying the intents, but I feel everyone will always be trying to convince you of something. Um, it, it's why multiplying the intent is important. But that's an important part of the book, isn't it? I think a lot of people from a starting point would say that their visuals are just seen as face value. This is just the world around us. And actually you talk about visual education and visual narratives that actually there is an understanding that we can place on those visuals and almost make us question and, and, and think about what we're seeing and why. That I think that's quite a big step for people to take. Can you give us a sense about how they can take those first steps and what they what they benefit from when they take those steps? The, the good news, first of all, is that 65% of us are visual learners. So actually, the world that we think is not ours is actually something that is most familiar to us. In fact, when we... When we try visual education on four or five years old, which I'm done because my eldest is four and it's cool, like they get it. If I say, how do you feel towards the scale of that picture? How do you feel with that color? How does that color make you feel? How were well your eyes traveling to? The kids can answer the perfectly. So it's supposed to regain the, the fact that you are not this passive person that just consume content visually. It's that you can very much interact with it. And then it's highlighting the many different ways in which you can um, interact with it and participate with it uh, once you've actually um, been able to deconstruct again that visual language. And you've asked for clear examples. 
I think there's many ways I feel, again, because what you're describing, and it's interesting to hear it from you, because I think that's what I hear a lot on the fact that this is just visual content. It's never just visual content, this content. Um, there's probably loads of people already just thinking digitally that, you unfollow, that you're following that actually are not inspiring you and probably are generating insecurities or creating like feelings in you that actually you're just, you're not, this is not your priorities or your values per se. So just even concentrating the, and, and making sure that the visuals you look at digitally on the apps that you have some level of controls, because I know there's that algorithm too, that you can still decide to follow or unfollow according to this. Um, when it comes to cities, what's really good and arrives through actually Black Lives Matters is that people realize that the public art that is around them represents them. So they've been more aware of the fact that like who you'll see on your streets is you and should be you, but it's not. Um, so I feel like there's there's a few trips or tips on making sure that first of all, you take streets that you feel more inspired visually. But after this, there's a bigger conversation again those are our civic spaces. Do we want to accept, and I know that's a big ask and a big change, but I think that is the next step, is do we want to accept to be constantly targeted on in our own public space? Because we haven't consented to this. You've consented to having a phone, you've consented to having apps, you haven't consented that for that constant targeting in your own public space. And maybe actually you, you're going to think, I want a part of it, but I also want to reject that constant targeting. And I that's a different conversation that started also through Black Lives Matters. Again, um, who represents us? What is that space? And if it's civic, then ultimately, do we want it to be a constant targeting of commercial imagery? Is there, or have you found through the work that you've done or the research that you've done, ideal civic spaces? When we talk about spaces that people feel at home, feel rested, relaxed, where they feel part of it, are there themes that come through that, you find that people warm to? I think that this is almost the irony in terms of academic studies because um, all academic studies in the University of Warwick did one for like 20 years, then mapped out in Europe the reactions towards exposure of commercial imagery. And as you can expect, the higher, the more miserable you feel. Um, but then exposure to the arts and nature is very simple. People feel a lot happier. Like there, there's no, there's never been any study that said, I got exposed to too much art and too much nature, really can't take it anymore is the answer. So um, you see it even with cities because now also there's a real rethink on on what will be centers of cities, especially as there's more deliveries being sent more directly, the retail spaces are changing. But I think it's only for you, um, if this evening you're kind of walking around, the place that people choose to be in is already a strong indication. And usually that's a really nice bench there's a bit of like nature around it. There's a maybe a nice square that's actually quite pedestrian. That doesn't have any cars. There might be like a nice design or sculpture or architecture. Like this is the thing is we have the answers in us. Um, the fact that those people have just chosen to be more in that space than the total opposite space shows us again, this is because that's something that makes us feel much happier. And, and I think people are like picking up on it and you have a lot more place making now where people are studying how do you ultimately recreate the centers in cities away from retail because retail also is challenged and, and redesign what that will be the future of a city with the spaces in. I think if you asked someone about a city and the sort of um, their favorite sort of image of a city or if they were sort of uh, absorbing a city uh, image, if you like, um, I'm, I'm minded to think of sort of the top of the Empire State Building where the city is below you, but also there's a lot of sky. Yeah. And there's water, and and you can see the park. Times Square itself is a really great place, but it's so overstimulating that if you would say pick your perfect spot, you'd want it. You'd want somewhere where you could take a little a little step back, if you like. I think we're coming, and this is the thing with that number ten thousand because it's projected um, that within the next few years it will again double. Like it's the the rate of in, in major exposure is so increasing that. I think people are getting to a point where they want that detox and they want that rethink. I think first of all, so I think it's come as a, I can see people having a stronger conversation for it. I feel it's also, we, it's not taking things for granted. Like realistically, cars are only a hundred years old uh, designed within a lot of our cities. You know, a lot of those billboards that we see are probably like 30, 40 years old. Um, so that they are, that means that, that ultimately we can challenge how they're being structured and reinvent new ways. We don't just have to accept 
that this is what the way the way the space is used and as one out of two of us will be living in cities like ultimately it's important to understand how do we use space because there's not going to be much of it so what do we make the most of that space for one thing i would highlight is that there's a study that just came out this week is that four out of five billboards in the uk is in poor areas so i think we we can't talk about the topic of my book without highlighting deep inequalities between people um which is ultimately if you're in a wealthy neighborhood, which is my case, and I'm very fortunate, I get to see um, really nice parks and really tiny shops and bits of art there and there. Um, but I think what the study highlights is according to income, your targeting and the, your uh, how comforted will you be with commercially major is substantially higher. Like four out of five is, is a crazy number. Um, so it's also just making sure that the visual environments we design is again, not just for a few nice neighborhoods, but does expand beyond that um, and make sure that this is a common visual narrative that we all get to design. And I think that's going to be really, really important because we need that social cohesion in the the visual environments we design. How does it affect our mental health? I mean, mentally, um, art has a super high effect, like 89% of people on the recent study, again, with Leonardo da Vinci or Warwick University says that exposure to the arts make them feel much happier. I mean, the arts have got a long tradition of being used for trauma and healing. And after the war, again, in the UK, like a lot of your uh, soldiers were sent um, to art school. It's something that's still used uh, as a therapy alongside dance and music and and, and the arts, plural. Um, exposure to nature is the same. Um, as we all know, that this is something that's also very healing. The other side, like I mentioned, is the higher your exposure to. And I think you, you said also the world... Um, distraction but i think there's two things here there's this constant um targeting of commercial imagery but there's also the fact that it's now constantly taking our attention away and they're saying that distraction is eating entertainment which was already eating art so you're just left with distraction which is ultimately your brain is not processing anything it's just you're constantly targeted and you're constantly seeing this images your way i wanted to ask you about that and you know you talk in the book about the infinite scroll which is this idea that if you just start scrolling on your phone it will never stop and you will that will carry on but then i'm thinking well at, at every point your brain is absorbing in, in different images and it's assessing them or it's looking for the dopamine hit that might come from seeing a particular image or reaction but then that never stops so it becomes this like I, i'm sort of imagining that eventually just our brains turn to to, to sort of like a gloop um whereby and we've just absorbed so much. We've seen so much that nothing even has an impact okay. anymore. Or the, or the impacts potentially more. We need to be more extreme, that we need to look for other things, that, that we start pushing out our boundaries into maybe unhealthy places because we're thinking, just give me something that, that sparks a reaction in what I've seen. Um, I think it was something that I did discover when I was writing the book and is in it is the fact that also as you're doing this doom scrolling, you're activating a separate part of your memory. So actually you can't even register that you spend so much time. So when you ask the participants in the studies, how long did you spend? They're like 30 minutes and it's always like three hours and like it's just a crazy number. Um, and that's because the conversation that we have, because we're active, I, this is a memory that we will have. Um, but actually when you're doom scrolling, it's, you're not registering even actual memories, which I found very scary. Um, but I feel again, I feel like this book is a hopeful one. Like it's the same when Social Dilemma came out with Netflix. Like you have to pose this a problem so that people become aware so then they can change it. And um, I work with tons of artists who ultimately are using AI to be super creative or using tech to come up with really interactive, immersive experiences. There's, there's a lot of um, in digital and technologies that have been used to specifically passing visual storytelling that I think is incredibly effective. Um, it is just changing again our consumption of it. How do we interact with it and our behavior with it? Um, I think it's it's always for me that the difference between being passive and active um, because that passivity is never good news. You're just clearly just like completely um, brain dead. Um, by the second you act with it, it becomes quite interesting because you can question, you have access to more information, you can challenge it, you can create it. Um, so it's it's not weird to think, oh my God, this was like such a big problem, I could never end this, and now I'm also doing scrolling, I'm just done. 
it's more thinking, well, how do we slowly but surely every day so I twitch a bit our behavior so that we get back into a position where we are leading more than actually being on the receiving end. You talk in the book about being your own moderator. So this idea that the, this critical thinking from the first scrolling onwards that you're thinking, right, how do I interact with that? I mean, that's 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 got to put us in a much better place because like you say, anything which you know costs you 30 minutes or three hours of your time to have nothing to show for it is both a, a, not a great thing to do, but also I, I now think we're in, like what could all what could I have done in that three hours, or what could have been achieved in that three hour period of time in which you have been sort of doom scrolling? Um, but being your own moderator, that critical thinking, is that something that you would like to see as part of your? You talk about a visual education that, that young people Actually. need to be. Is that moderation a key part of that? What is it I'm looking at? What is it designed I mean, to? I would dream of media analysis as a study. I would dream of images analysis um, as a study. Like there's so much you can do, even visual history. Like why is that person on the pedestal? Um, and again, what does that tell about us as a society that those images are on a pedestal? Um, the only reason why I, I really consider moving to Finland, uh, but I can't speak Finnish is because they have the space cooling system has critical thinking in almost every single of their courses, um, which is one of the top country for this and it is exactly that where history is not just history it's historiography you question why history was written that way i mean those kids are just equipped um they're equipped to understand that whatever information is sent their way ultimately might not be it might not be the truth and images is specifically that because images are something in the brain that we think well that's the truth that's it but as you know yourself like especially from a journalistic angle you take 200 images and then you just show one angle of those 200 images. Just even that reminder, this is just an opinion. This is an opinion of that specific event. And if I had been on the other side of the room, this would have been a completely different story. Um, I would dream for the, the kids to be equipped for this. I think if we believe that by 2050, 75% of images we look at will be generated by AI, visual misinformation and that visual critical thinking for those kids is necessary. Like they have to understand who created that image. Why is that? Like what level of truth or not is there to the, towards the event? What angle of opinion? It's just going to become absolutely essential. Uh, my, my wife said to me that, um, well, she accused me of ruining TV for her because we were talking about on TV, you see it all the time. Somebody knocks on a door on a documentary and yeah. when they open the door, the camera is already inside. The camera films the person opening the door from the inside. And I think, hang on a minute. How is that? About critical thinking of thinking, well, were, were we outside or were actually they in on it? And actually they already knew that they were going to knock on the door because they must have done. Naturally, because the, the visuals are created so smoothly, you don't yeah. second guess it at all. But if you introduce that critical thinking, you go, hang on a minute, there was already a camera crew inside the building at the point at which you knocked the door. Uh, uh, anyway, so my, my wife said to me at that point, you I really spoiled that. TV for me. <laughs> exactly. Imagining you every five minutes commenting how this was created is probably what makes it challenging to watch. But but I feel this is the thing is that I think being in the arts for the past 15 years, even if you know how difficult or complex things are doesn't mean you can't appreciate it. Like, I don't want people to feel you can't appreciate something because now you know that information. Like, to your example, if you know the movie is incredibly complex in the way that it's edited, it doesn't mean that you don't think, wow, that editing skill is incredible. You know, like, there's a real there's a real skill set in it. Um, but again, you need to know it's not reality, like you say. I think it's, it's always this thing of, like, especially as you're responding on effect, this is not real. Like... But that's totally fine to appreciate something that is, again, a beautiful storytelling. A, a, a pretty good example, to use art as an example, if I go into a gallery and there is one picture on a wall, and that's the only picture on the wall, I am being told, aren't I, that that is the picture that I should be looking at. But actually, that's somebody like yourself, maybe, who've gone, I'm going to put that one picture up on that wall, and I'm going to put 15 pictures on this other wall. Now, I might individually pick out one of the 15 as my favourite picture. Yeah, I will go in to that gallery going, this is the most important picture, or this is the picture that I need to remember. But that's because I've been presented it in that way, right? Yeah, and it, there's a brilliant podcast right now that is called Legacy. And I was lucky to meet that for who is one of the presenters um, last week. And I was saying to her, I love your podcast because it is exactly this. It's analyzing 
why did we give the importance that we did give historically to those characters? I'm asking almost a similar question is, why do we give this importance to the visuals? Now, there will be times where the answer will be like, because of all of these reasons. But there might be times actually you might be like, well, I'm questioning that. Um, or maybe it should be lesser importance. Or maybe it should be a mid-level importance. But exactly this, so they're just taking for granted that that power of being given might be valid, might could be questioned. Um, and I think this is why I love this podcast because it's never a black and white answer. You could never come out of any of the episodes thinking, oh my God, I've got the answer, this is black and white. But it does open your mind to thinking, who, whatever decisions we put, whatever visual environments we design, whatever environment we design, tells about us as people on our choices in who we believe most in, the values that we want to see. And um, if it doesn't, then we need to challenge it. Can I ask you about your social media experiment that you did when you put an image of yourself online? Um, yeah. Because I, I wanted to sort of ask you about that in, in terms of value of image, but also sort of almost like populism as well. Like what what will most people look at versus what is the appropriate image to show? Can you just tell us, Eddie, just explain what that sort of the experiment was? And um, I think I wanted to test as many years ago now, I wanted to test um, really whether female empowerment and a lot of what you hear in the media that this is now more discussed was really effective in terms of um, how is it what you most value about a woman today? Like, because apparently this is, we see it everywhere. And I pictured, um, I put a picture of myself in a bikini, which is something that I would do very, very rarely because I post mostly pictures of me leading the business or press articles or things that would be leading to the company that I need. And um, of course we had like 700 times more engagement. Like it was crazy um, in terms of the comments and the engagement. I think what it made me reflect on was many things. And actually, we're about to give a TED um, X talk next week, uh, which is, is a furthering of that topic. One, it taught me about the fact that if I was 15 and I'm so much more liked for my appearance, I mean, I'm going to concentrate on that because all of us just deeply wants to be loved and liked and conform. Well, this is all we really want. We just want to be cocooned in a place that tells us, you know, you're valuable. Um, so you're sending such short signals that ultimately say your appearance is by far the most important thing, irrelevant to everything that you had done. And I had just had the full session of the 30 within a few months difference. So it, it shows that this is like not as important partially, right? Um, I think the second thing, because now it's moved on a lot in terms of my studies, so it's quite a few years later, and I think ahead of the TED uh, next week, I think it also informs of our visual biases. Because we are more sub subconscious uh, visually, um, it shows that actually, again, that the constant objectification of women that we see daily. So, you know, like you are constantly seeing adverts of a young model advertising something realistically. She's advertising ice cream, cars, whatever she's advertising, but she's advertising most things, right? So this is so ingrained in us that this is again making us liked and endorse us images more. So I do think it's because the people think women should be objectified. I think is because, again, it's been so ingrained for so long that those visual biases have been pushed in so many different formats that we have ingrained those visual biases to thinking this is the most important thing. But it does concern me because there was a study recently that came up that your women actually are having less ambition than before, um, that this could be affecting a 15 years old who thinks, well, my value and my worth is fully on me wearing a bikini uh, more than anything else, you know? I could also, what I might be tempted to say as well is that, yeah, we could go to Greece and we could go to Rome and we could find statues of the equivalent version of the bikini image in um, great statues in really prominent locations. And I wonder if we talk about almost as a society, we have been viewed, we've sort of been bred to sort of view those as images, arresting images, because they're the ones that we place great value on, you know, the Adonis, the uh, Hercules type figure. Um, the shapely woman figure, and and that plays into sort of the perceptions of the role that men play. The great warriors, the the female mother figure, sort of, and that, and that plays that out in society now, doesn't it? Over, do you see the the woman as the warrior? No, because we don't have four thousand years of history where the the female warrior is the figure that you see, and that's why those visuals, I guess, are so important. And that's also where you can rewrite that storytelling. So right now, if you ask uh, the two main AI models, OpenAI or Mid Journey, who is a caring person, 
I'm afraid for you that's only women, that's only images of women. You're not included as potentially being caring. If I ask who is a CEO, well, I'm not included. So it's only men and your gray silver hair overlooking like a big tower building. What I mean by this is that this data set is not set in stone. You can start when you pull and you ask about little tips that people can do, but as you're pulling a marketing presentation, you can, the shoes, the choice of your images would again, could challenge those visual biases and could tell a new story. When you click on articles online that all you're scrolling, which article you're going to pick again is going to reinforce or challenge some of those visual biases. Which brands do you buy for? Are they the ones that actually endorse visual biases or are trying to challenge it? There are little actions that you can take every day as you as you're plugged in visually that can mean that ultimately storytelling wise you want to shift. Um, but I think awareness therefore comes in first. You, you you can only be aware first before you want to make those changes. No, absolutely. And actually included at the end of the book is a visual detox plan. And actually that when you deconstruct some of the ways, even if you change the way that you walk to work or the walk, the walk to school, you can change those and actually just think about the world in a slightly different way and allow your brain to sort of uh, detail some of those things in a slightly different way. It's a riff. I'd, I'd never considered it even as, a, as an issue. And I'm so pleased that I've been able to find out so much more uh, information about it because as you point out in the book, we are in a visual world, but so much of our learning is done visually as well. So it's a, a real great success, I hope. The Visual Detox, How to Consume Media Without Letting It Consume You. Um, Miriam, thank you so much for your time and thank you for joining us on Mental Health Monday. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you've enjoyed this week's podcast. Thanks for checking out Mental Health Monday. My name is Mick Coyle. You can find me on Twitter at Mr. Mick Coyle. You can also find me, Mick Coyle, on Facebook as well. Don't forget, if you want to speak to somebody about your mental health, you can do so. The Samaritans, uh, free to call on 116 123. You can find mental health services where you are. Just look for the Hub of Hope. Type in your postcode. It'll find those mental health services close to you. And for support in a crisis, you can text SHOUT to 85258. That's if you're experiencing a personal crisis, uh, you're unable to cope and need support. Uh, shout to 85258. That's a text line. Do get involved in those services. In an absolute emergency, always remember the number to call is 999. Thanks for downloading the podcast this week. We'll be back next week with more Mental Health Monday.